everybody to Design Beyond the Decline. Um, tonight we're going to talk about regenerative and distributed design and we're organizing this program in collaboration with the Distributed Design Platform, which is a creative hub um, with numerous founding partners all around Europe, but also including Pakhuis Weiger, where, as you know, we are tonight. Um, and the reason for this program is that we launched an open call to find designers, to find talents who are working with distributed um, and regenerative design at their fore, at really at the core of their work. And tonight we're seeing a selected group of them who are going to present their work and present what they're working on currently to us. And we get to listen, we get to ask questions and really get to know um, what they're doing and why it's important that they're doing this. Um, so yeah, it, it really goes every single direction. I'm not going to spoil too much because they're going to tell you all about it. And the way the program is set up is that we're going to listen to pitches from each and every one of them, eight people in total. I'll quickly walk you through their names in a second. Um, and we're going to discuss what they have told us uh, together with two table guests. Um, but also I want to give the floor to you. So if there are any questions after the pitches, any really, really, really burning questions, but also later on during the conversation when they're joining me at the table, there's more room to ask questions. Um, so please, if you do have a question, raise your hand. I'll come to you with a mic because we are recording this session not to live stream it, uh, but to document whatever is happening tonight. So please do wait until me or one of my colleagues have reached you with the, uh, the microphone so we can record your voice. Um, yeah, finally, my name is Julia, Julia Miller. I'm a program maker, researcher, and sometimes I moderate programs like this. Um, and as I said, I'm not going, going to do this on my own, but I'm going to be joined in a second by Pepijn Duivestein, who is going to open the floor talking about distributive design a little bit before we take off into the pitches. And then here's the moment where I'm going to walk you through all of their names. We're going to hear Typhoon Yalchin, Angelina Kumar, Nama Nikotra, Jos Krieger and Maartje Bos. And through Zoom are joining Catherine Larsen, uh, Larsen sorry, and Pia Groliger. Um, and we're also reflecting on the pitches uh, with Marije Remigius. Um, so all of this said and done, I would like to do a quick temperature check here in the room because I'm wondering what brought you here today. And if you would be so kind to raise your hand if you would like to share with us uh, what brought you to this room tonight or if you want to add anything else before we're going to take off. And don't be shy. And otherwise, I'm going to give you the floor, Thomas, because <laughs> you're a very special guest. Anyone else? No? Thomas. Okay. Here you go. So hi, I'm Thomas. And I was a program maker before here at Pakhuis de Zwijger. And I was um, uh, involved in starting this, this program as well. Uh, so, um, distributive and regenerative design is actually what we thought about because we're in this in this European project called distributive design, where we're talking about how you can share your designs all over the world and uh, where your designs can be made with uh, with the products or the materials available there. But then uh, I'm also part of the uh, of the Amsterdam Donut uh, Coalition which is all about applying donut economy here. And uh, so two of the, so I'll sit again because <laughs> otherwise it's not good for the people sitting here. Uh, so uh, one of the things that uh, Kate Rayworth, who is the, the inventor of the term donut economics is saying about how we should design our world is that it should be both distributive and regenerative as well. So also giving back to the world and uh, nature and society at large. So uh, I'm very excited to be here and hear about all of you. Thank you, Thomas, for this great kickoff. <laughs> um, but I think this just gets us to the point where I'd love to invite Pepijn and switch to the other microphone. And Pepijn is co-owner of um, New Economy. And this is a title to practice, Reconsume Sa Shaper at Upside Club Chico. Yeah. And I think you're going to tell us all about this. I think that's uh, indeed the challenge um, that we have to talk about designer products, but we have to well reconsider our uh, consumption. So at the preparation of tonight, I have to get a title who I am or who we are at the Upside Club. So we thought that yeah, um, we're trying to be a reconsume shaper. Uh, what that means means we don't know yet. We're in this transition to find out. 
Uh, but yeah, it's in short what we're trying to do at Chico. And what's the Upside Club? Uh, I think this should work. The Upside Club is, um, well, we hope a scalable product uh, or club that everybody in the world can crea create an Upside Club, but it's a regenerative shop. And not to sell stuff, but to create regenerative products. People can come in and work together and develop regenerative consuming. Instead of focusing on uh, share value holders, we want to create uh, uh, value holders within a community, within a society. And we started the first one here in Amsterdam. And we have a short little movie because we're still, well, let's say co-creating. So all uh, feedback is welcome. And this is uh, what we're thinking of currently. It's in Dutch with uh, English subtitles. That you nooit zeker weet what you koopt. And nooit zeker weet uh, of je er goed aan doet, wat je eigenlijk wel graag wil. Chico, uh, de eerste plek in de wereld waar we regeneratieve producten willen ontwikkelen in co-creatie met de omgeving. Het concept regeneration en ook waar het boek uh, eigenlijk over gaat is hoe kunnen we nou met elkaar dat gesprek weer meer gaan vormen. Ik loop wel eens met dit idee om een vergister voor de buurt uh, te installeren. Maar ja, om daar nou alleen mee te lopen, daar kom, daar kom ik niet zoveel verder mee. Ja, ik denk dat we gewoon heel goed zijn in vertrouwen hebben in elkaar in het uh, proces met elkaar, dat we vanuit niets iets kunnen creëren. Zelfs als je kleding koopt die uh, duurzaam is, je kan, uh, je kan zoveel mogelijk de fiets pakken. Maar ik denk dat er nog veel meer dingen zijn die je kunt doen. En daar denk ik dat ik uh, hier hoop nog wat meer antwoorden te vinden. Iedere vraag die, uh, die maar uh, speelt bij de consument willen wij mee aan de slag. En uh, dat gaan we op een hele transparante en open manier doen. Uh, wij weten ook heel vaak nog niet wat de juiste oplossing is, uh, maar daar gaan we naar op zoek. Buurtbewoners kunnen ook hierheen, heb ik begrepen, om een advies over de verbouwing van hun huis uh, te vragen. Van hoe kan ik dat nou echt duurzaam doen? Ja, van elkaar ook te leren over uh, welke uitdagingen we daar allemaal in, in tegenkomen. In dat pad waarin we de klimaatcrisis in één generatie gaan oplossen. Uiteindelijk uh, zijn we één aarde met elkaar. Moeten we samen deze aarde ook bewoonbaar uh, houden? Dus is het ook iets wat we niet alleen kunnen ontwikkelen, maar waar we die omgeving ook echt voor nodig hebben. Het well, yeah, is just een shop waar mensen kunnen vragen. Dat is de simpele antwoord. So, how long did it take to, to develop this? Well, as new new economy, we do a lot of uh, calculations or impact LCA, so life cycle analysis or uh, regional action plans. But every time, in my opinion, it's a very high level. So, but what do really people need within a neighborhood or on the street? So in the back, we have our, have our office and mm -hmm. in front, we have the couch to start the discussion with the neighborhood. So yeah, we just moved in uh, a month ago and uh, <laughs> today was Very like, fresh. yeah, uh, at four o'clock, somebody came in again and then you have this amazing discussion. And um, we hope in a couple of months, we have this model where, uh, yeah, you can become a member of the Chico one. This is Chico. Chico is the oldest uh, tree in the world. Uh, there was this Scandinavian biologist who discovered this tree and his dog is <laughs> was named Chico. And that's why he, uh, uh, well, uh, said to the tree, you're Chico now. Uh, <laughs> but um, yeah, so the Upside Club is a scalable model. We hope, let's say, like the TEDx manual that people can download the way you create a regenerative shop with people together. Uh, and we'll see what happens. I mean, it's, yeah, it's, it's just an adventure. Yeah, where are you located? Uh, at the Bosboom to Sandstraat. Well, it's in the middle of West here in Amsterdam. So we're very lucky. It's also with a lot of trees, uh, but it's in the middle of high consuming Amsterdam. Yeah. So around us is like uh, crazy franchise models, international models. All the money is also just and being spent in the neighborhood, but it's not, I think the value is not being uh, held in the neighborhood as well. So I think we're in a high demanding, high consuming place. That's why we find it so interesting to be there. And what are the types of questions that people walk in with? Because I can imagine, as you said, it's a different level. Yeah. And if you talk with policymakers about regeneration, it's, I guess, a completely different agree, com yeah. conversation than you have with people who pass by on the street. Well, is it affordable? Uh, when can you deliver? Uh, does it fit in my, uh, some about clothes? Is it really fair trade? They have the same questions I think we all have. Is it greenwashing? Is it not greenwashing? When is bio-based better? Uh, do I need to eat organic, yes or no? So, I mean, we're currently in this transition of all these models that are better than conventional. Mm -hmm. And every time we have to figure out 
well, what's the right choice? And uh, yeah, so uh, let one person, uh, well, one of the, the ones in the movies she, we just met, she has a restaurant, and we're gonna calculate uh, all her recipes to see uh, what kind of impact these recipes have. Okay, and do you feel that generally people know what regenerative means? No, at, in my opinion, I don't know uh, what it is as well. So, I, I, uh, no, I was going to ask you, can you please define it <laughs> for us, well, so I'm at least we try, have a common but, understanding. Uh, I think, I think it's, a, it's a vision we can all understand and correlate to, but how to act and really uh, 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 process it and implement it in the current economical context mm -hmm. is going to be quite challenging. So, yeah, um, for me, it's just... See, uh, being somewhere and leaving it better than I, uh, than I, uh, I, 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 I leaving it better behind than I uh, when I came. Okay. Is there anyone in the room who would, who would want to adapt this definition before we move on, add to it potentially? No. Okay. Then we're gonna settle for this. Settle for this one. Okay. But <laughs> I, do, I did uh, prepare something to give it some. Okay. Then we'll go ahead. So um, yeah, at Schoon Schip, we had uh, the same challenge to uh, really understand. Uh, how to be regenerative to create a floating neighborhood. Um, so I was uh, one of the lucky ones uh, to create a floating uh, house. Uh, and every time I thought, okay, what if I use a material uh, uh, that uh, at the core is already been beneficial for nature? So I lose, used a lot of bamboo. I used a lot of uh, clay. Uh, you can see here on the right, all the materials on the inside are circular or bio-based, uh, I just one simple, uh, um, let's say, rule. I want to uh, um, put it in my mouth if possible, which is strange to say that you want to keep- put To put it in your mouth or to eat it? Well, let's say if I would eat it, uh, it wouldn't be a problem. <laughs> so okay. all the materials are natural uh, or secondhand, but also natural, uh, which uh, led uh, to me uh, to an article in the New York Times, which I uh, talked to uh, Steenkode Dutch, so I said, I'm a crazy sustainable experiment bunny. <laughs> so um, that's now in I the I like New York your Times. way of titling. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, uh, and the simple way is to uh, explain regenerative, regenerating. Don't create shit. So that's why the toilet brush is there. And I'm going to talk about the toilet brush for a couple of minutes. Uh, but if you have a lot of shit in your toilet, you're probably, probably eating bad stuff. Uh, if you have less shit, you don't need to use the toilet brush. You're probably eating quite healthy or you're eating in the metabolism or the, the way you're digesting. So you can, I love the, the, the donut. Uh, we're using it as well. And I'm also part of the uh, current donut deal where we're creating this donut philosophy for companies in a part of Amsterdam, okay, how can you really benefit on the social foundation, but not exceeding the ecological ceiling? Who works has worked with the donut? Who has seen who has seen this for the first? Oh, that's who likes donuts. <laughs> Love <laughs> who them. Who thinks that comes in the toilet as shit, or, the, or do you think it has nutrition? Which donut are we talking about? Well, the one you eat, you probably, okay. yeah. Okay. But let's say that the donut, depending on how healthy, let's say a spinach donut that doesn't really assist maybe with a lot of uh, healthy stuff, well, is, has more nutrition. So this is one way to look at it. Then there's a drawdown framework. Who heard of drawdown or the 100 climate solutions you can implement tomorrow? Yeah, so um, do read this or contact me. We have a lot of information on this. Uh, that's also to look at a climate solution. But I think uh, Paul Hawken, who you saw in the movie, and we're very proud he was in the neighborhood to open the shop, thought, okay, to create all these climate solutions, we also really have to think different and act different, and our behavior has to be different. I mean, you can uh, uh, say we are change the light bulb from uh, conventional to LED, but that doesn't uh, change our mindset to consuming. And this is... I mean, read the book, it's really amazing. And then I asked to some friends, okay, what is regenerative uh, design? And I got all these answers. I was <laughs> like, okay, that's really hard. I only have seven minutes, so I'm not gonna tell that. Uh, but you know, my opinion, this is it. So uh, it's not me, um, Bill Reed created it. We as New Economy added some stuff because a lot of people say recycling is a solution. Well, in my opinion, it's not a solution depending on what you recycle. So let's put it on the left side of sustainability, but really focus on biodiversity, CO2 stored products. And then uh, also do never forget 
uh, about the greenwashing because it's happening a lot. A lot of designers are sometimes, with all due respect, misled by information of products, so they need the toilet brush as well, uh, which is a pity. And also a lot of companies are currently just, well, offsetting their CO2s, which is, of course, well, you need a lot of toilet brushes when you can fly for six euros a ton to the other side of the world. So, well, figure out how many toilet brushes you want. And then in short, uh, what I hope and I think is happening, and I think I've already looked at the eight pitches, um, this is a traditional, let's say, supply chain. Um, and currently, we don't understand the negative uh, impact, but for every euro you put in the system, there's almost an extra euro on climate depth or climate damage you're creating depending on the sector. So this is humongous. But talking about regenerative, it's on every step. When already processing or mining or producing the products, so let's say bamboo, and you uh, educate people in that system and it is uh, correct in the social foundation, that's positive already on um, uh, uh, producing the product. And then you use it, you can share it, you can maintain it, and then restore, reuse, or refurbish. But on every step, you can think of a positive social and ecological ceiling. So in short, don't design shit. Design for life, so on the natural beings, the human beings, and uh, think of designing for lifespan. So in my opinion, that's about uh, regenerating your daily life in a uh, big nutshell. <laughs> Very big nutshell. Um, thank you a lot for this. Yeah. Before we take off with the first pitch, I have one final question. Namely, we've talked a lot about regenerative design, but tonight is also about distributed design. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us two in two words? No, two sentences. I think you have <laughs> to be very bold, and I see some, I've seen some of the solutions. So it's also about a systematic change. So it's also on a show, social level, and not only uh, or an economical level. And I think we will see some examples here. Yeah. So distribute distribute the good ideas that are there. Yes. Open, open source. source them. Yes. Yep. Great. Make them available. All right. A warm applause for Pepijn Duivenstein. <laughs> And simultaneously, a warm applause for Angelina Kumar. I'm gonna give you this. And you have two minutes, and I'm gonna try to be sort of strict. Mic on, please, in the technical room. Check. Okay. Yes, there you go. So hi, everyone. Um, thank you for having me here tonight. Um, I'm from LDD, Lucrative Dumpster Dives. Lucrative Dumpster Dives is a foundation, or stichting, as they call it in the Netherlands, um, with the goal of turning the art and cultural sector into a circular, sustainable one. Um, we do this in uh, various ways. One is that we have a series of swap shops that we have set up within art academies and institutions where students and designers and makers and creators from the creative sector can actually um, swap and exchange their material on a regular basis and access free material. Um, and we also do this by uh, giving workshops and seminars, teaching the idea and the concept about circularity and sustainability and how they can, um, from a very, um, basic stage of their process of creativity, learn how to incorporate these methodologies into their practice. Um, we also have a project called the Creative Playground. The Creative Playground has a different spin in the sense that we work with a lot of makers and uh, artists who want to explore the ideas of circularity, community building, and um, uh, concepts of ecology in a public space. So we have a very... Um, special space in Utrecht, uh, which is for uh, the public. And the artists are invited to come there for a residency program where we sponsor them to come and experiment on these themes and work together. Um, well, that's a little bit about the residency program. And that's it. Wow. So tight. <laughs> yes, please join us at the table. And if there are no burning questions right now, and you can be bold. Then I'm going to give the floor to Catherine Larson, who is here through Zoom. Um, Catherine, if I'm right, you're an architect, and you're going to tell us some more about Farm to Table, and this is about seaweed. Yes, this is correct. Um, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm an architect MA in Denmark, and uh, for my thesis, I actually developed a framework for working with 
seagrass, seaweed, and shells as a regenerative source of materials for architecture and design. And one of the things that I realized is that historically we did not see these as waste. We did not see excess washed up seaweed as waste or seagrass as waste or shell waste as waste. We used it actually in the building industry in a variety of different ways. Seagrass was used to build dikes in the Netherlands and seaweed was used to create glue for, uh, for plasters and for paint. And shell was shells were used actually to uh, create concrete. Uh, so next slide, next slide please. So for my thesis, I actually created a framework of different biomaterial recipes that can be developed from all these different materials. And one of the things that I realized about the biomaterial movement is that it's not enough to just simply put a recipe out there into public. You actually need to teach, teach people the methodology to perform it. So I started making YouTube videos to teach people around the world how to actually start to prepare some of these biomaterials, hopefully inspiring the movement onwards. And today I still, uh, I mentor lots of students from around the world digitally on how to uh, kickstart their own production. So, yeah. Great. And I'm just curious, you're based in Denmark at the moment. How did you hear yes. about this open call? Um, I think Pepine showed it <laughs> on his uh, LinkedIn, <laughs> but also I, uh, I went to school at TU Delft. So I have ah, a lot of okay. uh, such people in my network. Well, great to have you, I guess, back for a bit. Yes. Um, <laughs> any burning questions? No. Then I would love to give the floor to Typhoon Yalchik. Hi, everybody. My name is Typhoon, and I am a permaculture designer. Since 2014, um, uh, I, after I registered my company in uh, Dutch uh, Towards Nature Permaculture des uh, Design Company in a Dutch Registration Center. I work in Amsterdam, based on Amsterdam, and I create economically and ecologically and also socially sustainable and regenerative places, starting from uh, community gardens, people's back gardens, school gardens, and anything possible. Now, in my um, career, I came to a point that uh, even I do these things, um, we don't change the direction where the humanity goes because the basic um, problem, the bottom line is humans live apart from planet Earth. So we need to bridge the gap where we live. If we don't change our living areas, living places, we are not changing our direction. So from this bottom line, I designed a a basic home where one family can live and calculated space that it can become uh, productive. It collects a couple of concepts inside. This family, when they do half time only one person, half time gardening, they can produce more than their need on the vegetable size only, but the house itself is self-regulating. It uh, recycles black and gray water. It creates its own electricity, and it also harvests rainwater and recycles that usage in the house. And the wastes from the house, when you step outside, you move into productive landscape. So productive means there is uh, in the ground base structure of planting from fruit trees to flowers to herbs. And base structure is done with permaculture techniques. And it, it goes outside of the house towards the food forest, which is a shared area. When you go one, when you repeat this um, design in a circular form, you create a small community, 10, 12, or 8, depends on the space. And this community is within one year 50% sustainable, within three years, profitable. So based on calculations, I created this design, but at the moment, our legislations are not up to date because this is two, 300 years old legislations we are living at the moment. Our buildings, our neighborhoods are defined and designed and created based on two, 300 years old legislations. This is not recognized by the law. So if I go one further and replicate this, I can create a village and there are systems, technologies that can supply the electricity here if you build in this scale. 
This is the house. I liked it because I went to the uh, architect. I found one and with a seashell, and he created this design for me. This is what I like, but it can be any form. It can be cubicle form, doesn't matter. But the important thing, it is functional. And because of our legislations are not ready at the moment, I came up with an idea that we can create a green circle around the cities that contains Foxtown look like places where people, where people can go gardening with this kind of a design. And then this green circle around the cities can supply the excess food and fresh uh, vegetables, uh, any, anything, herbs or uh, berries and any, any fruit uh, products, jams and uh, anything pickles you can imagine uh, in the city directly with the organic way. Typhoon, and I'm going to ask you to slowly wrap up. Okay. So there is a lot to say. There are a lot to, uh, to t talk about. But this is one and a half hour uh, lecture I, <laughs> I gave. So that's all uh, I can uh, tell you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yes, bringing us to the last presentation of this uh, little blog by Nama Nikotra. The floor is yours. So hello, <laughs> my name is Nama Nikotra. I'm an industrial designer, and this is my graduation project from Industrial Design Bachelor uh, from HIT in Israel, Naked Pack. Naked Pack is a series of packageless pre-cooked pre meals that are wrapped with edible plastic that is mainly made of seaweed. Naked Pack was created from a combination of two issues that are really close to my heart. Uh, anxiety from climate change and my huge love for food. <laughs> when it comes to food packaging, plastic and papers are main players. The World Economic, Forums predict, the World Economic Forum predicts that by the year of 2050, there will be more plastic than fish in the ocean. In an attempt to find a natural bioplastic, I started my material research. I tested many, many natural materials. Um, the final formula contains uh, water, oil, and agar, which is produced from uh, seaweed. The resulting material is transparent, tasteless, and uh, can be manufactured into two-dimensional foils or three-dimensional structure. Uh, spices and flavors can be added to it, and uh, it's possible to rinse it in water. And now for the most important question that you're probably thinking about right now. Isn't it disgusting? After all, packaging and wrappers are designed to separate food from the outside world. Well, I call it the apple principle. We already buy naked food, we just don't think about it. Fruits and vegetables are sold in bulk, exposed to dirt, people and animals, and we just wash them and eat them. We also buy pastries and sometimes nuts and spices, and we don't wash them. Um, so the naked bag uh, can be rinsed in um, room temperature water and then, uh, boiled in, uh, and then cooked in boiled water. In this project, I offer five iconic and tasty, and tasty dishes. However, Naked Pack, the vision can be adapted to a big variety of different dishes. Uh, all the dishes, including all the flavors and the spices that are necessary, and it's one portion for one person to uh, save as much, food as, as much food as possible. So uh, first, the soup. You can see it here, but I will show, <laughs> also show you the sample. This is the food. It's made of vegetable stock, and there is dry frozen vegetables inside. This is the spaghetti that is wrapped in um, tomato sauce. <laughs> I'm excited. Um, the curry. So the wrapper is made of green curry that you can actually smell and touch. And inside, there is uh, one serving of white rice. The lasagna actually shows the possibility to make um, a sheet layer of every ingredient. So there is a, a layer of uh, Beyond Meat uh, that you all know, the vegan substitute, um, a layer of vegan cheese, a layer of tomato sauce, and a layer of the lasagna noodle. Um, since it's not cooked in a pot, you just place it in a pan, cover it with water, and bake it in the oven. And for dessert, of course, there is the ice cream, a scoop of vanilla ice cream wrapped in raspberry sauce. Um, it's not cooked, it's frozen. You can just rinse it in water and eat it like an apple. Um, Naked Pack is a vision for the near future in this changing world. And in these times of change, 
what can be a bigger comfort than a delicious food? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, I was going to ask, can we pass around the plate so that people can see it from up close? Oh. Take a look at the table and then I think we can pass it around. Um, the audience as well, because it looks fascinating. Thank you. And you have tasted everything? Of course. And how? <laughs> How would you like it? Um, it depends on the ingredients. <laughs> I mean, if you use delicious ingredients, then it's really good. Um, yeah, you're welcome to, uh, to touch, touch it. it yeah. Smell it. Yeah, yeah. No problem. Cool. Just many, many people touched it, and it's not rinsed in water. So <laughs> don't, li don't, <laughs> don't lick it, chew. maybe. Yes. Well, it, it takes us right back to, to what Pepin told us at the very beginning. You have to ask yourself, do you, wanna, do you want to, and can you put it in your mouth, maybe? So maybe mm -hmm. this is the common thread of the evening. Mm. Um, but maybe to come back to you, Pepin, do you want to have? Do you have any questions to the to the presentations? Also to Catherine, on the Zoom, first and um, foremost. Yeah, I mean, uh, the, they're all four uh, are very uh, important, and let's say a traditional question would say, "How is it scalable?" But I think <laughs> uh, yes. no. I think how is it? Uh, um, how would you make it uh, possible that people can copy it very easily in different contexts in the world? So the component of the distribution, right? Yeah. Yeah. Does any of you want to start answering? Angelina? Sure. <laughs> you looked um, at me first. Well, I think uh, the concept that I have isn't exactly um, brand new. Um, I think sometimes a lot of old ideas are swept under the rug and those can be um, brought to life and they can be easily copied and copied in, uh, anywhere and localized in, in a local context. And I think that's what I want to do with my thing is just show that it's possible and yeah, it's it's simple. It's it, it, all it takes is a little bit of tenacity and hard work because you have to work up against a kind of like old school institutional uh, way of working. So, yeah, great. Mama. So, um, since I'm not a chemist or a biologist, um, I had to use a lot of recipes that actually Catherine talked about that are open source and you can find easily online. And this is in this way, I really wish to share um, my knowledge and to share the recipes and the methods of manufacturing so people can cook it themselves and also maybe big companies will consider it as an option for their products. Have you been in touch with any? Larger companies, any larger producers? Yeah, so one uh, big tea company contacted me. Um, they wanted to use the material uh, to replace their tea bags, uh -huh. and then to just you know dip it in hot water and it melts, and you drink your tea without anything inside, which is exciting. And is it happening? Um, I hope it will. I mean, <laughs> cross fingers, fingers. But we'll see. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> Amazing. And Typhoon, what about you? How do you work with? Because especially maybe your idea can be quite hard to implement because it's quite a, a broad concept, but how do you implement this in it's already? It's very simple. Okay, tell us. Give me one hectare, please. <laughs> I, can, I can show you 10 houses. But in, in terms of implementing this in already uh, built structures, like existing cities or existing villages? At the moment, it cannot exist because by law, it's not recognized. Okay. Our legislations do not recognize uh, either grassland or agri uh, agri agriculture. agriculture land. But there is no mix. So when I go to the um, municipality, they say, we don't know this. What is this? This is the way we need to go further. So uh, the reason I'm here to create publicity that people support me in any way, that I can create just one. Just if one. I create one, more will follow. then it will be no knockdown effect. And do you know of any other I mean, international examples that are doing the same kinds of things, and are you in touch? Close examples, yes. In America, I have, I've seen a video, actually, I, I haven't visited yet. Um, but um, design way, uh, when people move into that house, immediately the next day they are becoming productive, and it's directed by design to, to live that way. That is the power of the design. Mm -hmm. So it, this doesn't exist yet, in my opinion. All right. There are a lot of eco-communities, but they have to buy the land where they can do grow their vegetable things, productive, and where they can live. They cannot put it together. That's the main reason. Mm -hmm. But I'm open uh, any suggest any pilot, <laughs> any pilot project. I'm gonna connect you to a project called Park on the Hook. 
van de gezonde stad. Ja. Where uh, communities can get a uh, part of the public space in yes. the city of Amsterdam and different municipalities and create an uh, urban uh, a farm together. So, okay. uh, Sounds good. Yeah, the, 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 the city wants it as well. So I can connect you to the project called Park on the Hook. So they Park Around the Corner. You think they would uh, allow me to put buildings in? Well, uh, I'm not going to speak for them, <laughs> but you never know. <laughs> okay. If anyone in the room has good connections, <laughs> know where to find tyf Typhoon afterwards. Um, Catherine, what about you? How do you work with the, the distributive uh -huh. element of the, uh, the seaweed farm to table? Uh, this is actually a very important part of my research because when I was researching, especially seagrass, um, seagrass, different seagrasses do not grow around the world. Uh, for example, in the Netherlands, all the seagrass was mostly killed from the Ausleutdijk in the 1940s. Um, so it's really important to pay attention to what local resources are actually available. So seagrass that is in Denmark. Um, is a different seagrass that can be found in the Mediterranean, but the seagrass that can be found in the Mediterranean that washes up can also be used as insulation uh, in the building industry. And many of my recipes are calibrated so that a red algae from a different region can also be used in place of a different red algae. And my plaster recipes I developed using red algae local to the Netherlands and calibrated it for that but was actually based on traditional recipes from a, a very uh, rare red algae from Japan. So um, I paid pretty strict attention to what type of algae or species was used in each part of the process and also tried to test how different from the same, different species from the same category, red algae, seagrass, they would react in that process so that these are solutions that can be localized in different regions and hopefully scaled up locally as well. Great. I was wondering, maybe you have any questions to each other? Also the other designers, or anyone in the room actually. Just put up your hand if there's anything. Don't be shy. Um, but otherwise, I have plenty of questions. I, I see someone in the back. I'm going to come to you. Yes, OK. So uh, I was wondering about the permaculture gardening. So what is the biggest uh, um, sort of like law that, that prevents uh, or sort of like limits the use of uh, this system that you have? Because I, I for, for example, I know in Almere, they have been trying this, uh, that everyone is cleaning their own water system. And now it sort of like doesn't hit, uh, you know, the right, um, uh, it's not clean enough according to the oh, regulations, yes. right? So, but yes, I understand. But what is your biggest um, okay. burden then in that? Yeah, I understand. Uh, Almere also world, I think you are talking about. Uh, I visited there. I have um, clients there as well. I'm designing their gardens. But uh, the, the thing is, um, uh, Almere opened the land for buying individual establishments. That was the problem. It wasn't designed. Everybody did their uh, housing, gardening by their liking. But I'm suggesting something designed from the beginning, everybody gets a similar and from the beginning guided garden. You don't have, uh, how to say, uh, I like it that way, I like it that way, but oh, it didn't work five years later, let's do it that way. This is a design based on permaculture principles that I know that they are going to be successful. And then I know that this house is going to produce its energy. I know that the food forest is going to produce uh, enough food that they can sell it later. So the, the power of my project, the, the design, comes from the design itself. Uh, because the, there is no uh, room for uh, being unsuccessful. Uh, Almere now challenged with the, all everybody did in different ways. <laughs> and now they are, they are harvesting the problems because uh, everybody individually have a different problem. But if, if, if it is designed one way, and then we can, we, we, we can study one place, you know, well, I am looking for one hectare place. Uh, but and the thing is, um, when we apply to this municipality or uh, organizations that allow the land usage, um, like in Almera, I couldn't pass the secretary. They doesn't understand <laughs> what I am talking about. So this, this, there is no platform to discuss these things. That's one platform I'm here, <laughs> but governmental level, we cannot influence any decision. Where's the platform that we can give ideas? We are into this. I've designed eight communities in Amsterdam. I implemented them. So 
uh, I have some experience, where can I apply this for general public? So there, is, there must be an open platform that we need to see who is approving, who is rejecting what, and they, ca they can take responsibility about their actions. They are behind the email aliases, behind uh, some titles, but nobody knows who is uh, rejecting what when we give projects. So we need to make it a cl clear platform. When we give a project, there must be clear guidance of uh, what is sustainable, what is, what is the value for people, what is the value for environment. This must be clearly uh, analyzed by the questionnaire. This exists. But I think, I think in the exists. in the current uh, woon opgave, so the, the the living challenge we are creating in the Netherlands, we are uh, uh, gonna uh, co-create and create more ownership models uh, in the next couple of years. So I do think you're uh, um, well. Um, you're saying something that is very valuable, but I do uh, also want to uh, show that uh, a lot of possibilities... I mean, it's, we're in this transition model. It's very much shifting indeed. Yeah, because it's really, really shifting. And I think the community land trust model yes. uh, is something that is happening in a lot of municipalities. And I, th I think your designs will be great to uh, um, well implement in the combination of a community land trust model. I'm open. <laughs> I think it's yeah. also very much a matter of, of in how far the, um, the values that are intrinsic to the donut model have really sunk into the more bureaucratic layers of, of different municipalities. Yeah. And I think, and I'm also looking at Thomas here a little bit, who's working very closely with the different partners here in Amsterdam about being the first donut city in the world. But, it, you know, you can have, um, on the one hand, the the intentions of doing it differently. And on the second hand, you have all these people implementing all these different things with still uh, the jurisdiction that is attached to that. And I think, as Pepijn said, there is a transition, but it's also yeah. sometimes quite slow. Um, Be a little patient. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But this also br brings me to the next question, which is we're discussing regenerative and distributed design here, which are two terms that are not necessarily extremely familiar within, let's say, the people outside of this room the general population, how do you make sure for each of you that whatever you do resonates with the people that you want to reach? Maybe I'm just going to look at you first, Nana. I, I need you to ask me <laughs> this again. <laughs> I'll, I'll ask you again. So the, the thing you're doing is, is pretty applied. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's about food, it's about food waste, it's mm -hmm. about how can we um, store our food. Mm -hmm. um, but the idea it comes from is from regenerative and distributed design, but how do you make sure that when you reach out to people that they, on the one hand, are attracted by the, the product you're making, mm -hmm. but at the same time understand where the product comes from and what ideas are the ideas that drove you to design this in the first place? Yes. Well, first, since it's food and we have to consume it forever <laughs> until it helps. We, find, <laughs> we find another solution. So I think it's a good way to address it, to address a big uh, audience, for, for the first thing. And then um, I feel like the more aware we become of uh, sustainability in general and uh, our role as consumers, it's not just the role of the like big companies or the designers or the producers, it's also our role. So then we look for more things. And I think it's, it's um, you talked earlier about greenwash, it, it became harder to, to find out um, if it's really fair trade, if the if it's not greenwash, and um, I think that if we share more information, we really let people know about our intentions and about the materials we use. And sometimes it's enough to see that a company does not share information to know that sh if she doesn't Maybe share something it, isn't yeah, right. Don't yes. share it, yeah, we don't want to know that. Yeah. So I think being um, open and um, with clear intentions about everything um, to address people. Um, I, I feel like there are two um, comments about my product. Some people are very excited and <laughs> <laughs> and some people call it space food. And I don't think that's a compliment because <laughs> space food is designed to survive and yeah. it's not designed to give you comfort. And um, astronauts usually talk about how important food in space is um, by giving you comfort when you're so far from home. So I hope people can really feel uh, 
I, I hope so. You tell me that when I design this food, I really try to make it appealing and uh, comforting and to really remind you where food comes from and not make it like completely instant or like something very generic that um, yeah, not, gives not you. Not just the basis of we need it to survive. Exactly. Yeah. So I hope it tells its own story. I'm not sure. I, I'm, I mean... I'm sure I can work on it much more, but... Maybe we, we can ask some feedback later on from the people who've yeah. now all touched it. But if it's space food, if you think it's space food, <laughs> then <laughs> Please don't, don't tell say. me. <laughs> <laughs> um, and Angelina, how is this for you? Because what I'm wondering mostly is, are you explicit about the reasons behind doing what you're doing? Or is it more like you, you let the people experience what they experience and then through that experience, let the idea sink in? Um, well, actually, what I found was that if you uh, just give an open platform, it doesn't function so well without an explanation. And that's actually where the workshops and the seminars came into place, because I really had to bring the, the visitors and the students and the artists um, a space where they could basically play around with the concept of circularity first and give them actually show them what the options are like show them what the possibilities are and that in itself is the most important thing because then their own ideas are, are triggered and it's really just it's more like giving a place for the ideas to grow around circularity how they can apply it to their own lives and their own practice and that's actually the most important part of it, rather than just the stores or just the the circular uh, and sustainable um, places that people can experiment. It's really to just let them absorb the idea and tangibly take it on. Yeah. So yeah. And and take it upon themselves as something they own as well. Yeah. And and let them grow with it further, and maybe come up with more ideas. And and yeah. And the people who come in, usually, are they already? let's say, into sustainability? Um, well, I think it people that come in have come in for multiple reasons. A lot of the um, people that use the stores, for example, are students, so they're very poor. <laughs> or not very poor, but like it's uh, in the art and creative industry, it's quite expensive. It's a quite an expensive sort of luxury um, field. Um, and this is like one driving force. So that's like, oh, there's amazing material, it's for free, and then the next step is like, well, this is the reason why it's there for free. And the concept is really that they don't just take, but that they give back and that they keep giving back and that that practice kind of is regenerative. <laughs> and that takes education and that takes the, the constant connection with the, the people that are participating. So that's essential, actually. Nice. And Catherine, what about you? How do you make sure that all across the, the globe, depending on whatever seaweed is there at hand, people know about this. How do you reach out? Um, I think I reach out in different ways because I have totally different target audiences. Of course, there's a lot of students who approach me, but I find that by um, exhibiting my work publicly through different design avenues, by installing it in ways that is very visible and very public, it invites the public to have a conversation about it. And then one of the most uh, strong driving factors that seems to really unite people is to actually talk about how people culturally in this country or in this country, in your country, may have used this as a material in the past. And that really resonates with people, that really connects with people because they start to understand too that this is a material that belongs to them and their history and their traditions, and they start to get excited about it. So I have different ways of connecting with people, of different of educating people, but at the end of the day, it's about trying to guide people through this knowledge. It's, and I agree with, uh, with um, the previous uh, speaker that, yes, it's not enough to just have an open platform. You actually do have to educate people and, you know, communicate. Um, that's a very important part of the process. Thank you. Are there any questions in the room right now for the four presenters? Yes. So I'm, I'm curious, I work in technology and I'm thinking about how people invest in technology and spend ridiculous amounts of money scaling up ideas that are sometimes stupid and crazy and people invest $44 billion in Twitter and whatever. And I, I'm wondering how do you take these kind of things and create an incubator or a platform to give the kind of scale that it needs with investment and not have people just thinking about how they're going to get rich and have an exit strategy and whatever, but think about how it's going to turn into something bigger. Big question. 
So traditional, indeed, we have pre-seed, A till C series, and uh, we call it intellectual property and patents. Um, this, in an, uh, let's say it's healthcare as an example, is the way we earn a lot of money by keeping people sick. That's just what's happening. And this is happening for a lot of stuff. So no, I don't think we have to look at the traditional model uh, of investing. investing. I think it's very simple. Put your money where your mouth is. Catherine is maybe here because she, I uh, shared a LinkedIn post, but also as New Economy, we were looking at a gift uh, last year around Christmas, a regenerative gift. And I was looking and I found an artist. I mean, now she's an architect, but she's also an uh, artist and a talented, beautiful uh, drawer. And she was creating lamps and was like, "What are you're creating sea seaweed lamps? What is that? And we, uh, well, we made contact and I said, okay, we're creating this new office. We want to gift uh, a gifted person the opportunity to create their products. And we ordered, I think, 10 uh, seaweed lamps, uh, which are already, let's say, on a positive side before it's a lamp. And that's, I think, it's amazing. And I think we look have to look at crowd solving and uh, value holders, where as a people, as a community, we become the uh, co-owners, let's say, through a stewardship model of these companies. And um, I hope the tea company uh, do provide your service, but watch out if they say, okay, we want this uh, as a uh, uh, competitor advantage. No, we can do this with you, uh, the first one, but the rule is you can have the competitor advantage for maybe six months, and then we're gonna replicate or duplicate or give it to the world. And I think that's on the inventor side, but also on the consumer side, we have to work together and not be uh, framed with all these techno technologies and investments. But in a short story, with all the stuff we're doing, 90% <laughs> is going uh, bad. And that's all in the, uh, in the price of the first product. So if we create a regenerative economy, it's going to be cheaper for us as well in the, in the near future. And maybe it's also like a switch in mentality towards yeah. like the, the concept of things being like open platform, open source as a value rather than it like this idea of like we need to keep everything for ourselves and we have to patent it. And I think I still see that a lot with the creative um, solutions that are coming out, but that's the difference with the donut economy or regenerative design yeah. and distributive design is that it's really like, here's something awesome. We need this to replicate please take it on yourselves and here we're going to help you. And that shift in that mentality is very, um, I think it cr makes a lot of people who are money driven cringe. <laughs> so that's something we have to change. And I think we also have to f help um, each other to find ways to support um, the, the process and go further. And these kind of platforms do that. So it's amazing. Thank you. For a long answer. No, that's that's really great, and I think we'll we'll come back to that when we have the next group of presenters here. For now, I'd love to thank you, Angelina, Typhoon, Nama, and Catherine. Warm applause. <laughs> and then I would love to welcome Maria Remigius to the stage, who's gonna sit next to Papijn, so also you can see the presentations well. Very good. Hello. Hello, Maria. You're a I have to speak. Sustainability manager at Fiction Factory. Yes, indeed. What does it mean? What, what do you does do? that mean? What yes. do you do? <laughs> well, so Fiction Factory is an interior building company in the north here of Amsterdam. And we create business-to-business -business interiors, custom-made. Custom-made. Yes, and we are already 30 years old. And do you design them too or just build no, them? No, we don't design them. We engineer them. So you can mm -hmm. discuss what is design, when, when does design start, right? But uh, the architects and designers are our clients. But of course, we help them uh, to uh, to make things really work and stand up, <laughs> for example. Yes. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, and then, yeah, uh, four years ago, I became the sustainability manager because I did research in circular economy and I found out that everything that we build doesn't last very long. I think 90%. And, and wait, but how come? Is that how come? Is that due to you and due to the materials you yeah. use? Or is it <laughs> We're due bad to the builders. people no, who are no, like, no, oh, no. actually, we don't like the design we designed. A return no. on investment. Yes. <laughs> yeah. No, but it's, this is an honest question. No, 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 I understand. No, I understand, of course. The, the thing is that the industry that we work in is uh, like a fair building. So that's most of the time three days. Exhibition building, that's three months most of the times. And uh, uh, interiors for retail, they last five years. Hotels, restaurants, maybe 10. So we already know when we start producing that it will become waste. 
Um, and then, yeah, when I did research in circular economy, I found out that with my uh, cabinet making skills and craftsmanship and all my colleagues doing that as well, that we are indeed making beautiful waste. And um, yeah, Beautiful shit. Yeah. <laughs> nice words. Yes. yes. <laughs> a lot of toilet brushes we need, yes. So, uh, and, uh, and this is really a waste, right? Also from our craftsmanship as well. And uh, so, um, yeah, I, 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 I checked everything in, in our company and, uh, and, and looked, you know, how is the factory working as well? You know, the things that we produce, now we really want to take back and reuse the materials as much as possible. But uh, I found out that the company produces waste during production and... Um, Due to do we, that we make uh, custom-made interiors, 50% um, uh, of the wood that we buy becomes waste during production. So uh, I looked at how come, and then we found out that the digital production of the work that we do is uh, mainly caused by the CNC machine. So mm -hmm. every CNC um, sh machine, like there's loads of them all around the world. Uh, so every sheet on the machine uh, already has a waste percentage of 30%. That's pretty high. Every sheet on every machine all around the world. And uh, many people don't, or many companies don't see this as a problem because uh, I think one uh, square meter of a sheet is about seven euros. So why bother, right? It's a money thing. Money thing, yeah. And uh, so I decided to go for that one because I thought it was really easily because, you know, you start engineering, you have the design, you do you know, do the best thing you can do. But I found out that I needed a software solution for this and creating hardware as a company, going into software was a big thing, right? So I need nerves for that one, I thought. And uh, so uh, I collaborated with uh, Ayak and uh, Jesse Howard, he was also here. Um, right. An artist approach also on our problem. And that's really nice uh, collaboration. And there we sort of like optimized the production uh, this way, but also created the tool, thanks to Jesse, that um, now not we are saying what uh, will be nested in the sheets, but now also algorithmically um, the computer produces um, sp yeah, uh, objects out of the sheets that okay. we have to deal with, right? Because <laughs> I don't know if anyone knows what the CNC machine does, but it sort of like routers out shapes, any kind of shapes that you want. It could be squares, which is quite boring for the machine. Programmed, so, right? Yes. <laughs> but now sort of like it finds, you know, the software now finds objects in there. And it's funny shapes, like you can see here now on the pedestals that we had on the Dutch Design Week. Yeah. So. Great. And you're sustainability manager. I don't know how large exactly the fiction factory is, but how... Did all of this land with the rest of the of the factory of the company? Was this an easy transition, or is it really something to battle? It's a battle. Um, just a few days ago, I, I was talking about in the chaos I'm in now. So you say transition, I call it big chaos because you know, like if you're a 30 year old company, you have the way of linear way of production. You no, know, we order materials, we produce, then we put it out, and now I'm uh, holding back production waste and i'm taking things back so what to do with that you know there's no logistics things about that so where do we put it everywhere and uh, yes yeah, so i also made a shout out uh, at the beginning of the dutch design week because this is an exhibition there saying okay now the now the all these materials are in the right place now for nine days. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have to think about it for nine days. For nine days, yeah. yes. I can relax now. But then, of course, I have to think about what will happen after nine days. So, and then all my colleagues are sort of like sometimes. Everything has a label with Marije on it now. But of course, it shouldn't be. <laughs> Your office is probably the biggest of the entire company. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> right. Thank you a lot. You're going to, together with Pepijn, also reflect on the, on the next couple of presentations. Mm -hmm. um, and the next person that I want to call to the floor is Ma Maartje. Maartje Bos. Um. Ah, thanks. Good evening. I have to put a... Aha, uh -huh. okay. Yeah. What if waste does not exist anymore? What would cities look like? I dream of a zeal in cities where we use all potential of people and resources where we value, uh, where the value we create multiplies and remains in the community. Language and rituals matter in how we look at the world. Oh, yeah. At the Green Up, we bring this dream into practice. We develop and implement donut deals on urgent issues where we combine at least three social challenges with one ecological challenge with minimum two partners. Now back to the swale. There's much to win in our system. 
Do you know that food waste is a prominent source of carbon dioxide? In Amsterdam, 98% of all household food waste, which is 70 million kilos a year, is burned, causing CO2 emission, fly ash and other pollutions. The biodigester we have in the Green Up is a regenerative machine. It processes 50 kilo of food waste per day, per day, producing 50 cubic meters of green gas and 50 liters of biowater. Biowater can potentially be used in horticulture. The implementation of the digester as a donor deal means the social impact of the digester is just as relevant. Schools are engaged and offer educational programs about the digester. It leads to awareness and engagement of our food waste habits. Less food, less food waste on the street solve our web problem and it reduces the cost of picking up trash. In addition, it also creates jobs. This is the first mini digester in a residential area of the whole country. And as such, we tackle major barriers. And here you see all the, uh, with the red dots, all the uh, issues we address in the, within the donuts. In our pioneering role, we recently developed an international donut deal with partners in France titled Together Clever Towards Reuse of Our Organic Resources. We make our learning distributive and will find ways in scaling up to 20 new digesters or more in Amsterdam and with one high pressure uh, digester that is connected to the sewer to serve whole uh, Gaspadam with green gas, all residents. That's our dream for the future. Uh, this donor deal was made during the donor deal festival 18 of October at Pakhuis de Zwijger. Thank you. <laughs> then now we return to the Zoom where there is Pia Groliger. And I wonder if I pronounce this correct, but you're going to talk us through the project of Pure Kala. Yes, um, <laughs> I'm actually a co founder of Pure Kala. And um, I hope you can hear me. We can. Go on. Okay. Great. And I would like to talk about our latest project, which is focused around water filtration. So during our research, we found out that springs in Triglo National Park, the most protected area in Slovenia, are polluted uh, with E. coli bacteria because of agriculture and tourism. We designed a ceramic water filtration device, which functions as a mechanical filter meaning the water flows through the porous material, which blocks particles the size of bacteria from passing through. Um, to speed up the filtration process, we had to design forms which um, increased surface area. That's why the bottom part of the model is designed as a geoid structure, and the upper part of the models is inspired by Archimedes screw which enables to transport the water upwards. We used uh, 3D printing technology to be able to work with raw material, which otherwise poses a lot of uh, limitations when dealing with complex forms. So the models are submerged in the water and are rotating because of the reverse flow. The water is absorbed in the bottom part of the object from where it travels up and leaves the system on the top. Because of the use principles, the system can work in remote areas without electricity, and also it doesn't require a lot of maintenance. Um, the project was designed for production platform at the Biennial of Design in Ljubljana, and um, I would love to answer the questions if you have some. Thank you. And we'll turn. Uh, we'll return to the the question part later, um, because first it's time for the final presentation of the night by Jos de Krieger. Yes. Uh, good evening. Uh, I will tell you in just two minutes a little bit about wind turbines, and uh, it's great that we have them. They produce a lot of green energy, but there's also a waste problem associated with it, and that is the blades that are available. Uh, after 15 or 25 years of lifespan, and we replace the turbines by bigger turbines. 
still good, but there's not really a good way to recycle them. So we propose to repurpose all the blades in different designs. So far we have reused 27 in different projects from playgrounds to public furniture, uh, well, artworks slash furniture, another playground, and recently on the Dutch Design Week, this exhibition of a boulder blade, which is also a certified playing equipment that we can just reproduce basically everywhere because there's just a few producers of wind turbine blades. So there's a repetition in models globally. So this can be applied in the United States, in China and in Europe and basically anywhere else. And we're trying to do that in all those countries at once right now. Um, the biggest goal in the end is to repurpose all the blades and therefore we envision sound barriers along highways. You just see the small top in the right corner. The cars are behind this and actually the best place to be is right on the other side where noise is almost gone and uh, plants on top filter, uh, find those particles, create a habitat for animals and bees, etc. So that's the end goal. Wonderful. Thank you. So first impressions by either you two or anyone? Uh, no, very impressive, everything, <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, so I didn't know, I have a question for, I don't know her name anymore, sorry. Pia. Pia. So um, wh what have you been printing it out? What kind of material is it that you're using for it? Because I didn't. Um, actually, it's clay mixed with organic material. Oh, no. uh, we used uh, sawdust, but you can actually use anything which would burn in a clay oven. <laughs> okay, good, okay. And is it, I was wondering, also a question for Pia, mm -hmm. is it already in use? Um, yes, we we used it for triennial in Georgia, in uh, so we filtered their river, I'm not sure how it's called, but uh, with Floating University we built this whole structure uh, and it was used, but we still haven't actually integrated it in Triglav National Park. Okay, and is there anything you need to be able to do that or, or is it just a matter of time at this moment? Um, actually, we, we um, yeah, it's a, it was quite a lot of working with 3D modeling because the, the item you see, it's quite, um, yeah, it's very, it's huge files. So we need to still uh, correct all the small peaks where the water could leak. Um, but otherwise, I think it's also a little bit of uh, financial support problems at the moment. And um, yeah, I think that's it. And are you financially, su sorry, many questions. Are you financially <laughs> supported by an external party such as a governmental body or something else? Um, not really. In Slovenia, we don't have a lot of uh, that kind of support especially not in design field. Um, but we are still searching for potential investors and partners. Um, we so will see how it goes. Anyone um, in the room with a large bag of money? <laughs> <laughs> it's actually applicable to all of these projects, of course. Um, Pepijn, do you have any questions for, uh, for any of these three presenters? Uh, no, I'm really happy with the biogester, and I think and the movie you saw, so we can do the next one at Chico. Uh, yes. the, there was a request, so super cool that you created it. And I think also the blades, I mean, it's super important. And you, we could say that the windmill itself is already, let's say, climate positive because it creates energy, but indeed we have a huge wage problem. So it's super cool to see all these solutions uh, on the long term. And this biomimicry solutions, I think it's so beautiful. So I don't know, I, to be honest, I don't have any question. I'm just amazed uh, <laughs> yeah. what everybody is creating. And and uh, and uh, uh, my question would be, uh, uh, let's say, what is your biggest challenge as a designer or as a producer or as a social, uh, let's say, entrepreneur uh, to really uh, uh, scale this up? And uh, which resistance do you uh, feel and how can we help each other? All right, well, let's just go make a round, Maartje. Yeah, uh, well, I started talking about waste and that we really need to redefine. So that's the first issue uh, we need to uh, address because the whole system is looking at swale as a waste. Uh, so as I said, we have ma major issues. The beginning was the permit. Now we still need to have... Um, 
uh, insurance for the digestion because it's in the living area. It doesn't exist. So it's so much pioneering. So at this moment, moment, I have to be honest, it's not yet on because we still have to tackle these uh, issues. Um, yeah, and I what I uh, didn't mention, but what I also personally love about how we make it distribu distributive um, because people, if it's restaurants or households that bring the swill, they bring value. So we want to find ways that also we share the benefits uh, amongst everyone, all the local restaurants, community centers, school, who brings in the value. Even though the gas is only going to uh, the green up, but they are the one who are bringing in the value. So that's really what I love personally. Um, yeah, but all these issues that is really it starts with, uh, and, we, and we are doing that with the gemeente, with the municipal also, in uh, how we can tackle that. Uh, and another thing is that the biowater, um, we cannot use it uh, at this moment uh, for um, horticulture or even uh, football fields. Uh, so we have to first measure the biowater, and yeah, it's quite complex. So yeah still need to take a lot. Maybe we put it through the filter of her then. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> really, really interesting combination, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but you trigger me by, by using the word pioneering. I think all of you here are doing that, including the two of you. And it's, I think, at the very core of, of distributed design, regenerative yeah. design, forming a community in which you can share also the know-how of starting something that doesn't exist yet or that yeah. is, you know, happening in this transition where... Everyone has these little pieces of, of knowing to do it in all these different contexts, but how to build them together. Um, Jos, can you also answer the, the scale up question? What do you need or what do you yeah. really? Well, well, there's a couple of things, of course, that are uh, playing around at the same time. But I think you mentioned something in the first block, Pepijn, about intellectual property. And that is a really big issue uh, because we currently basically live in a society of distrust where we want to yeah. basically remove all negative aspects of a deal or hide it somewhere. But what we're doing right now is pioneering. We are uh, basically cutting the blades to find out what they are like and to see what we can do structurally. Although there are perfect drawings of them, they are covered by intellectual property and we have to move up back to the chain. Although the blades are no longer produced because what we use is 15 years or 20 years old mm -hmm. um, and there's no market for it anymore. It's still intellectual property that they are, well, it's not easy to get hold of. Um, and of course, the same will happen the other way around. If we protect our ideas and our drawings uh, not well enough, then somebody can walk away with it and it's gone. And if we protect, protect it too much, then nothing will happen. Yes. So there's a fine balance that we need to find, basically in the whole society of trust, yep. where uh, we credit the people that do something, that do the pioneering work, without trying to create new billionaires, because that's not what we need. No. Praise, amen. Uh, in, the, in, the, in the donut economics from Kate Rayworth, um, well, it said, okay, we want the social foundation and well, we don't want to exceed the ecological, but to create this, we have to figure something out and that is purpose, finance, governance, ownership and networks. It's not going to be in the slides because it wasn't there. Mm. <laughs> but um, uh, I think th that's very important. So if the purpose is the same, the governance is uh, within the community, the ownership is within the community, so not the intellectual property, uh, the networking, and maybe I forgot some, one of them, uh, is the same. The I think financing. The financing, yes. Um, they're uh, co-owned, so the governance, ownership, and finance are equally. Now finance is more dominant sometimes than governance and the other way around. Uh, really look at this design and, and, and together if we as let's say uh, a small uh, SME companies but we will grow already interact together and we agree upon these new values we can create a, um, a economic system in the current system together I really believe yes. in this and then uh, well we can step by step uh, eat food uh, that is uh, how do you say apple wrapped uh, and uh, enjoy a, uh, a water cleaner uh, system uh, because um, there's not an external party uh, trying to explode us and do you think there is enough this is also to all of you is there enough of a community to to share those practices together yeah here in yes. Amsterdam and beyond? 
Well, I think if you talk open source, right, there's b- big platforms where you can share things and uh, and, and it's, it's really crazy what, what people do. It's just sort of like take your design, make it better and and, 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 and share that again yeah. as well, right? Yeah. So, uh, and uh, the only thing is that for us, for example, it's really hard to, you know, if you want to share, you need to document things very good. So how did you do it? So, and I like it that, you know, making YouTube tutorials. So that's also an investment, but it's also good to share this. Uh, yeah. Mm. Yeah. Because yeah. then it can only grow, I say. Yeah. Yeah. And Pia, how is this for you, the, the question of upscaling and, and what is what are the largest obstacles for you to really do what the water filtering needs to be doing? Um, I talked a little bit about this already, but uh, one thing I haven't mentioned is the very rigid law situation regarding water in Slovenia. I'm not sure how it's in the Netherlands, but here water is clean. If, it has some t- certain amount of chlorine inside. So if you, I mean, it depends on what scale you want to go, but this is something we were kind of worried about. Otherwise, um, the project is pretty new. Uh, we are still having quite a lot of obstacles. Probably others already passed them, um, but yeah. I hear a lot of, uh jurisdictional obstacles co- coming back and I know within this um, field of, of design you know you have designers you have artists you have researchers but maybe we need to incorporate some more lawyers and, and people with some uh, some law know-how <laughs> seems like a good idea um, the floor is open does anyone else have questions or maybe one of the other designers wants to pose the questions to the people here at the table or the other way around anything is possible just raise your hand <laughs> ah, you rolled it. <laughs> I was wondering if we're talking about design and regeneration, what is the um, tension between using the old, like uh, the windmills, and designing new, like Typhoon maybe mentioned? Um, because I, I can imagine that there is some material that is fundamentally... N- yeah, <laughs> but we need to do something with it, so I, I'm curious what the tension is there. Let's hear it from you. Yeah, um, well, to start... Of course, these blades are made of glass fiber reinforced plastics, and I would say it's not necessarily a good material, but it's still the best way we have to harvest the energy from the wind. And what we try to do with repurposing the blades is extend the lifespan, at least double it, but preferably triple it or quadruple it. And that means that we flatten the curve of uh, carbon emissions for that product. And in the end, hopefully after I'm gone, it will go into recycling and we can make something else out of it because it is possible, but it will take a lot of energy energy to chop this down to small particles and then put it in some, something new. So we need to extend that as long as possible. Mm. So and, and it acts as a substitute for concrete, as an example, in the uh, noise cancelling wall. Yeah. Well, but so but then, it, then it's beneficial, but of course we hope we can create, uh, 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 let's say not glass fiber, but bio-based fibers and a lot of developing and mm. all these... Uh, that Catherine with the seaweed and you see a lot of all these amazing smart people trying to identify and looking at nature how strong can we make materials so I really believe in let's say five to ten years we will have a bio base and bio degradable uh, well fan uh, yeah well five to ten years uh, sounds (laughs) optimistic but but let's (laughs) go but indeed (laughs) because we substitute a lot of virgin materials to make this playground we can reduce up to 90% of carbon emissions compared to a conventional playground So that's what we do right now by uh, keeping the material alive. And ma- go ahead. Yeah. No, no, I understand. It's, uh, no, but yeah, within the cradle to cradle framework, uh, they would say this is a shit material. We should not use it anymore. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's a valid point in a way because it is. Uh, but because we have it, we should use it. Yeah, it's already there. And I think this ties into you, Marije, right? Because you're dealing with all these materials that are already there. Mm-hmm. Coming back to you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> and at the same time, you're thinking of new ways to not send out into the world these materials that you can't use anymore when they come back. Exactly, yeah. yeah. So we, yeah, so we, uh, of course, now pushing designers to use the other materials and sometimes saying, no, we're not going to use that because we're not going to take it back. If you if you want that material, yeah, so you so. can influence like that. Yes, yeah. and I saw Typhoon with a hand, so I'm coming to you. Uh, thank you. Um, about the materials and the obstacles, uh, the imagine 
what is the biggest problem in the Netherlands right now? Uh, one of them is nitrogen emission, farmers, and the uh, housing problem, if I can say at least three big problems. Imagine instead of one million housing, which is going to deduct from farmland, covering with asphalt and beton and everything, build unsustainable buildings. Instead of that one million housing, how about we build one million sustainable communities around cities? What did we achieve with this? Nitrogen emission is gone. We created food forests all around the country. We solved housing problem. Can I ask more? Social connections, <laughs> health, orga organic and healthy food, connection of fam families, all about our thinking. Yeah. If we change our thinking, anything is possible. All everything connects to one direction. But we need to get to that direction. We need to lead each other to that direction. Thinking is the most important thing. Thinking is the most important thing. And I feel that I can really wrap up this evening perfectly now, unless there's anyone else with a burning question. I'll come to you. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> so I was thinking uh, when you're talking about um, all of these things, people are, uh, sorry, I think about money a lot. They, <laughs> they're, they're buying carbon offsets, right? And people are investing in things that have this kind of negligible or, or not really tangible value. The things that all of you are talking about have real value from a sustainability standpoint. And is there a way to turn that into something that you know, rather than it just having to grow organically and in a small way like you were talking about, there's actually a way to drive mm. that the money that would otherwise go to things like carbon offsets into this kind of stuff because it has the same type of value. I think we need the lawmakers on the table again that make the legislation and see how we can get carbon offsets for our playgrounds because I wouldn't mind. And actually, we're looking at that for the United States where it might be a bit easier to get that permit or, but yeah, that would be great. Problem solved. <laughs> yeah, I think um, it, it's coming step by step. By, by, so there's gonna be like an eco tax or a CO2 tax, or, uh, then this will flip around. And you have a lot of, uh, uh, do look into the bioregional weaving lab society, uh, pretty, uh, pretty long. Uh, but with Co Common Land, Ashoka, Drawdown Europe, uh, we identified all the nature-based solutions in Europe. And last uh, yesterday, there was even another presentation with Jonathan Foley from the Drawdown uh, Framework in the States, and I was following this. It's now really easy, well, that's easy. It is uh, possible to calculate uh, on an, uh, a regional level which nature-based solutions are most applicable. And we created this for Europe, and step by step, we can, well, as you were mentioning, create communities who can really thrive and learn in a different way to consume. So uh, the information is there and step by step, I think, creating your own community and then to wrap it a little up. Um, that's why we created Chico as new economy. I mean, if you look at our balance sheet money wise, Chico cost a lot of money this year. But we believe in a year's time, we're gonna find a thousand members who are gonna pay 10 euros a month and we're gonna give the shop back to the community. That's our philosophy. We have a year for this and maybe we go bankrupt, we'll see, but just do it. Or, I mean, you can think about money and keep it on the bank, but just create stuff. And the last, well, I've been now a co-owner of New Economy for set five years and our only philosophy was sharing stuff. And, s and stuff comes back as a boomerang, like the, the windmill, before you know it. So In a good way, right? In a good way, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and sometimes quite hectic. But uh, just find your thousand people. Uh, if everybody, uh, or with a group of ten people, find thousand people to uh, start a discussion, in my belief, we can wait for regulation or just start tomorrow step by step with 10%. Uh, a good is 20% uh, of gain. That's also the easy calculation because you're doing 10% less bad. So if you just change, change one day uh, in the week your total habits, it's going to be very profitable for ourselves and uh, for your surroundings. Well, thank you for that wrap-up. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, well, <laughs> to, con to, to take matters into my own hands and to, to really formally wrap up, the final thing I want to lay on the table is how can we really make this regenerative process, both in the in the social uh, context as well as in the more ecological and design context, how can we make it the norm? And you answered part of this, but maybe anyone else of you wants to add to it, because I think what comes back a lot is, you know, it's a mindset. You have to think about it differently, but how do we make sure that all the people around us, not just the people, you know, who've been 
educated to think in this way or pushed in this way because of bare necessity? How do we take the people with us, municipalities, big money, anyone? Typhoon, I will come to you with the mic. <laughs> but in the meantime, March, if you want to <laughs> set us off, then I'll walk. <laughs> yeah, it's a big question. I'm thinking. I would say it's one word, Le legislation. Legislation. <laughs> yeah. What I found in my uh, last 10 years experience is creating examples. If people don't see examples, they don't, they don't physically can visit or experience. This is just uh, another method to page, turn the page. We need to create examples, pilot projects, uh, usage of each of innovation. If the examples are in the middle of society, people go for it because it's benefit for them. So imagination, legislation. Um, and also just making it super simple, like mm. keeping it as easily graspable as possible. And that's, I think. So maybe stay away from the terminology of distributive and regenerative design. <laughs> well, <laughs> well yeah. maybe we need to change the definition of what a pilot project is because a pilot project is not an experiment. It's the way to go forward. Yeah. Mm. I like this, yes. Um, I believe that um, this kind of design should be less privileged and feel more inclusive. Um, I think that usually when we talk sustainable design, it becomes very, very, as you said, for the educated people, for the people who are aver aware of this, but maybe if it can fit all types of populations, more people will gain some interest in it and it will be part of everyone's life. This is what I... Nice. Okay, so before I go to the Zoom to collect the final answers, we have legislation, we have examples, we have or imagination, we have make it simple and make it inclusive. Let's see what else we can collect. Catherine, yes. do you want to add? I think my answer ties into this also, but uh, communication and also um, I think there needs to be a lot more financial support um, either from philanthropic philanthropic organizations or there needs to be more investors willing to actually hopefully uh, put their money where their mouth is and uh, you know put put some trust in the people who have researched and worked with this and know what they're talking about so that we can actually get these pilot projects onto the table because seeing is believing. Thank you and Pia? I'm not sure if I have anything to add. <laughs> Everybody, I mean, great answers. We have um, a manual now, it, it seems. I've written yeah, them yeah. down. I have my. But, I mean, I would uh, point out, make it uh, understandable and simple, because I needed quite a lot of time to really understand both of the terms. So, yeah, um, maybe, yeah, that's it. I think maybe if we rebrand re it next time, we can fill the big hall. <laughs> Who knows, Marcia? <laughs> Yeah, well, besides the donut, we also have the pizza model. It says uh, first social transition, then democratic uh, transition, then comes the economical transition. So to connect with the social, with the social issues, that's why we have three one, uh, but also your own personal transformation. I think that's key. And besides that, we should dream more. Dream, if you dream your ideal, Brazilian city or community, we can bring it into practice. So, uh, yeah, that's what design uh, makes designing also great, right? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for all of this. And this brings us to the conclusion of the evening. I want to thank all of you at the table, you sitting in the first row and everyone on Zoom. Uh, let's conclude with a big round of applause for everyone. And of course, you, our audience, also. Thank you a lot for being here on a Friday night. We appreciate it a lot. Um, I think this also uh, means that we can go to the bar, have a drink together, continue to discuss. I think most of the speakers will hang on a bit, except for the people on Zoom, unfortunately. Um, so feel free to, to find each other to discuss. Um, some last notices. We'll be back in January, if I'm saying this correctly, with more programs on distributed and regenerative design. Um, and finally, you can become a friend of Parkhuis de Zwijger and support us in continuing what we're doing, making programs about this and all other topics that we're covering. Um, and you can scan this QR code or find more information on the website. And finally, for the entire agenda, we have programs every workday, work night. Uh, you can 
Find all information on www.deswijger.nl. And yeah, have a good evening and see you at the bar. <laughs> oh, final thing. Uh, final Bye, Pepijn. Yeah, I want to uh, normally, because we're talking <laughs> about the commercial break, uh, we would like to give all the eight designers the possibility to display. Uh, uh, we have the, the window of Chico. We're developing this, and we agreed upon, maybe I think with uh, Thomas uh, at the start, cool. uh, that we would like to give you the opportunity to present your work in the display starting, let's say, next week till uh, New Year's Eve uh, at Chico. Uh, so let's have contact. And that's the idea of Chico. People can show uh, solutions uh, in the middle of the street. Uh, and people are walking by. They're making pictures. So uh, the gift is here. Great. That's Thanks. amazing. So everyone come to the Bosboom to Sandstraat. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> And now the music comes. Now the music comes. <laughs> <laughs> Again. Thank you.